Good morning students. Welcome to today's lecture. The topic for today is disorders of bone. Today will be part one of this topic. The learning outcomes for this topic include at the end of this topic the students will be able to categorize bone disorders and give at least three examples for each. You should be able to list out the three types of fibro-osseous lesions and describe them in detail. You should be able to differentiate clinico-pathologically between the three types of fibro-osseous lesions. You should be able to explain the etiology of dry socket, list at least three oral manifestations each for metabolic and endocrinal disorders of bone, you should be able to identify and illustrate the histopathology of fibro-osseous lesions, central giant cell granuloma, osteoma and osteosarcoma. In today's topic, we are going to discuss about the fibro-osseous lesions in detail. Various disorders can affect the bone. The craniofacial Skeleton is a complex of bones which primarily involves the maxilla and mandible. Other than that, other bones such as the zygoma, the sphenoid bone and others form the complex craniofacial skeleton. A number of pathologies can involve these bones. These pathologies can be grouped as fibro-osseous lesions, inherited and developmental disorders of bone, inflammatory diseases of bone, metabolic and endocrine disorders of bone, basis disease of bone, central giant cell granuloma, exostasis and various tumors. It is advised that the students find out examples for each of these categories. It should be noted that Paget's disease and central giant cell granuloma are individual lesions and do not have subdivisions. Similar is the case for exostasis. For the remaining categories, it is ideal to note down the various types and remember at least few of these. So to begin with fibro-osseous lesions, it is important to understand the definition of this term. A thorough understanding of the definition will help us in understanding the pathology better. So these fibro-osseous lesions are described as a diverse group of processes characterized by the replacement of normal bone by fibrous tissue containing a foci of mineralization that vary in amount and appearance. So the basic pathology in all these fibro-osseous lesions would be that the bone will be replaced by a fibrous tissue such that its physical properties become weaker. So overall there are three main types of fibro-osseous lesions which we should understand thoroughly. These three types have been categorized as developmental, reactive or neoplastic in nature. The developmental form of fibrous displays uh, of uh, fibro-osseous lesion is fibrous dysplasia. Reactive form of fibro-osseous lesion is osseous dysplasia. And the neoplastic form is ossifying fibroma. We will be following the 2005 WHO classification for fibro-osseous lesion. Under this classification, we can see that the three main types are fibrous dysplasia, osseous dysplasia and ossifying fibroma. Other than that, we have certain other pathologies which have been grouped under fibro-osseous lesions and these include central giant cell granuloma, chervism, aneurysmal bone cyst and solitary bone cyst. Fibrous dysplasia are further subcategorized into three types. These include monoostotic fibrous dysplasia, polyostotic fibrous dysplasia, and craniofacial fibrous dysplasia. Osseous dysplasia are also further subcategorized into four categories. 
These include periapical osseous dysplasia, focal osseous dysplasia, florid osseous dysplasia, and familial gigantiform cementoma. Ossifying fibroma, on the other hand, can be broadly categorized into two forms clinically. These include conventional ossifying fibroma and juvenile ossifying fibroma. We will be discussing about these patho pathologies in detail. So, to begin with fibrous dysplasia, it is one of the common types of fibro-osseous lesion. It should be understood that fibrous dysplasia occurs sporadically and not inherited. However, certain severe forms of fibrous dysplasia may be inherited and genetic in nature. Fibrous dysplasia can be broadly categorized into two subtypes. Monoostotic fibrous dysplasia and fibrous, uh, polyostotic fibrous dysplasia. This Categorization is basically based on the number of bones involved by this pathology. So, as the name is suggestive, monostatic fibrous dysplasia will include the pathology involving a single bone. Whereas, polyostotic fibrous dysplasia will include more than one bone of involvement by this pathology. The bones which are commonly involved include the bones of the craniofacial skeleton. The long bones of the lower limbs are also commonly involved. Long bones of the upper lips and the axial skeleton are involved to a lower extent, to a lesser extent. Fibrous dysplasia involves a mutation of a gene which has been labeled as GNAS1 gene. This is the guanine nucleotide alpha stimulating 1 gene. Mutation of this gene results in activation of the cyclic AMP which will result in alteration of the gene expression and signaling pathways which in turn control the growth and differentiation of osteoblasts. So, to remember that fibrous dysplasia is a developmental pathology. So, the development of, of bone is genetically determined which results in the expression of osteoblasts which would result in the formation of bone. So, in this pathology, a genetic defect involving the GNAS1 gene will basically affect, it, uh, affect the differentiation of osteoblasts. The resulting pathology will involve a bone with poorer quality as opposed to a normal bone. The bone which occurs in fibrous dysplasia will have a replacement of normal bone by fibrous tissue. Clinically, fibrous dysplasia presents as a painless, asymptomatic, slow-growing swelling of the jaw. Over time, this would result in asymmetry of the face, especially with prominence of cheek. Fibrous dysplasia commonly affects the maxilla as compared to the mandible. Most cases are monostatic in nature and would hence involve a single bone, either the maxilla or mandible, for example. However, in case of the maxilla, the maxilla is intricately associated with other bones of the craniofacial skeleton, such as the zygoma and the sphenoid. So, in some cases, the fibrous dysplasia would be affecting the zygoma and the sphenoid bones in addition to the maxilla and technically it cannot be considered as a monostatic form. So such forms have been given a specific term of craniofacial fibrous dysplasia. As discussed previously, jaw bones are the most commonly affected bones in this pathology. Other bones affected include the limb, 
ribs and skull. It should also be remembered that fibrous dysplasia is basically a disease involving the early years of childhood. This lesion is common in the first and second decade of life. The pathology involves the females more commonly as compared to the males. Intraoral examination of a case of fibrous dysplasia would reveal the following key features. As discussed earlier, there will be a swelling which would result in asymmetry. So we will be able to appreciate a swelling of the jaw. It could be the maxilla or the mandible. The patient will give a history of a slow growing swelling. On palpation, it will appear hard. The swelling would result in cortical expansion of the buccal side or the lingual side. When it occurs in the buccal side, it will result in obliteration of the vestibular sulcus. The growth may also uh, result in displacement of teeth. These features can also be seen radiographically. But before that, we will go to the discussion of polyostotic fibrous dysplasia. As discussed before, polyostotic fibrous dysplasia is when more than one bone uh, uh, is involved. Polyostotic fibrous dysplasia is less common than monostotic fibrous dysplasia. There is multiple bone involvement. Similar to monostotic fibrous dysplasia, Female are more commonly affected in polyostotic fibrous dysplasia as well. Radiographically, the fibrous dysplasia can reveal various stages. In the initial stages and the established stages, we will find a mixed radio opaque radiolucent appearance, as seen in this OPG. It is always advised to compare the lesional bone with that of the normal side. As you can see here, the density of the bone seems to be reduced here. The lesion is not clearly demarcated as it tends to blend with the normal bone. This appearance has been described as the ground glass appearance. Terms like orange peel appearance have also been used to describe the radiographic feature of fibrous dysplasia but the ground glass appearance is a more appropriate term. Periapical radiographs taken for the involved tooth region will reveal that there is narrowing of periodontal ligament space and loss of lamina dura. These are important points and should be kept in mind during the diagnosis of fibrous dysplasia. So, the term ground glass appearance is basically related to the opaque glass which we find in various buildings. The opacity of the glass does not allow the other side to be seen clearly. So, the appearance of this glass will look similar to that of the case of fibrous dysplasia. It should be kept in mind that Fibrous dysplasia are also seen as a part of syndromes. Basically, the more severe forms of fibrous dysplasia are seen in relation to syndromes. And these are basically severe forms of polyostotic fibrous dysplasia and not monostotic. So, the syndromic forms of fibrous dysplasia will, for, will have affected more than one bones. The three common syndromes which are affected in fibrous dysplasia include mccune albright syndrome, Heffel-Lichtenstein syndrome and Mazabrot syndrome. In mccune albright syndrome, the, there is polyostotic fibrous dysplasia in addition to which we can see pigmentation of skin which has been described as cafe ole macules. These cafe ole macules show the appearance of the coastline of Maine. 
In addition to skin pigmentations, we can also see other endocrinal abnormalities, especially the presence of precocious puberty in females. Hafel Lichtenstein syndrome is another syndrome where the polyostotic fibrous dysplasia is also showing pigmentation of skin that is similar to cafe au lait macules. The third syndrome that is Mazabrot syndrome shows polyostotic fibrous dysplasia as well as intramuscular myxomas. As discussed before in the pathogenesis of fibrous dysplasia when it is a case of monoostotic fibrous dysplasia or polyostotic fibrous dysplasia alone the genetic defect will affect the differentiation of osteoblasts. However, in advanced cases or severe cases, the genetic defect will affect other cells of the body as well. Melanocytes are commonly affected in such severe cases. Hence, we can find skin pigmentations in these two syndromes. In more severe forms, endocrinal cells can also be affected resulting in more pathological manifestations. So, we should remember these syndromes. Sometimes knowing the syndromes will help us to identify a case of fibrous dysplasia. Cafe au lait macules are important aspect of identifying the case of fibrous dysplasia. However, it should be remembered that it is not characteristically associated with fibrous dysplasia only. There are other pathologies which also show cafe au lait macules. The cafe au lait macules may have an irregular border as seen here or they may have a regular border. This will include neurofibromatosis and McCune Albright syndrome. So, a case of neurofibromatosis can also show cafe au lait macules. So, it is important to take into account the other clinical manifestations before identifying the syndrome. Identification of fibrous dysplasia will require a biopsy. An incisional bone biopsy will be performed following which the slides will be observed under the microscope. Microscopic examination shows irregularly shaped trabeculae of immature bone which lack an osteoblastic rimming. This is a characteristic feature of fibrous dysplasia. A normal histological section of bone will always show osteocytes within lacunae and the trabeculae would be surrounded by osteoblast in the periphery. However, in case of fibrous dysplasia, we will see the osteocytes within lacunae. However, the peripheral osteoblastic rimming is deficient in fibrous dysplasia. This is the characteristic feature and helps in identifying the pathology. It should also be noted that the surrounding stroma is cellular. We can see an increased number of spindle shaped cells in the stroma and it will show some amount of fibrous content. It should also be noted that the bony trabeculae are not connected to each other. A normal bone will have the trabeculae of bone which is dense and interconnected. However, as the the term fibro-osseous lesions describes there is replacement of normal bone wind fibrous tissue. So here it can be appreciated that irregular trabeculae of bone are separated by fibrous tissue. Another characteristic feature which is seen commonly in the fibrous dysplasia is the description of this bony trabeculae. The bony trabeculae are found to be curvilinear in shape, forming C-shaped structures. These irregularly shaped bony trabeculae give the appearance of what we call as the Chinese letter pattern. The Chinese letter pattern does not mean that 
these bony trabeculae are giving some meaning. We should not try to understand it from that aspect. The basic orientation of this trabeculae overall resembles the, the script of the Chinese language and hence we call it the Chinese letter pattern. Treatment of fibrous dysplasia is based on the, the stage of the disease. Some lesions will grow slowly until the bone uh, growth continues and ceases to grow after maturity is attained. Some lesions may even regress on its own. So the treatment for fibrous dysplasia is generally conservative and requires surgical removal for aesthetic purpose. However, it should also be noted that fibrous dysplasia can show malignant transformations. But such instances are rare. However, it has been seen that cases of fibrosarcoma, osteosarcoma or chondrosarcoma have been reported in cases of pre-existing fibrous dysplasia. Some studies have also reported the use of pharmacologic therapy for the treatment of mild cases of fibrous dysplasia. So, we have to remember the key points of the pathology fibrous dysplasia. It is more common in maxilla related to the GNAS1 gene mutation. There is a fusiform bone expansion commonly in the maxilla. Radiographically shows a ground glass appearance. Margins merge with the surrounding bone. Delicate trabeculae of woven bone are seen without osteoblastic rimming. The expansion usually stops after skeletal maturity, which can be confirmed by scanning of the bone. Treatment will include recontouring. So, moving on to the next pathology that is osseous dysplasia. Osseous dysplasia is a, a, a reactive lesion which occurs in the tooth bearing region of the jaw. This is the most characteristic point of the pathology. An osseous dys dysplasia will always be associated in the tooth bearing region of the jaw. That means the pathology is closely present in relation to the tooth. It is also a common fibro osseous lesion and sometimes the term cemento osseous dysplasia has also been used to describe this pathology. It should be noted that most of the cases of Osseous dysplasia are diagnosed incidentally when they are noted in radiographs which have been taken for some other purposes. For example, in case of orthodontic treatment, a case of fibrous dysplasia may be, a uh, case of osseous dysplasia may be identified. It should be remembered that osseous dysplasia is a reactive lesion and is related to a periodontal ligament origin or related to a defect in the extra uh, ligamentary bone remodeling due to a hormonal Im imbalance. Based on clinical and radiographic features, there are four types of osseous dysplasia. These are the periapical, focal, florid and gigantiform cementoma. The periapical osseous dysplasia occurs characteristically in relation to the anterior mandible tooth. As we can see in this radiograph, there are two or three lesions, three lesions which are associated with the mandibular incisors. Focal osseous dysplasia is a case of isolated lesion in relation to one single tooth. The mandible Mandibular posterior area is the most commonly affected region for focal osseous dysplasia. The florid and familial gigantiform cementoma are more extensive forms and involves lesions of more than one lesions of osseous dysplasia which are involving more than one quadrant. So in florid and gigantiform forms of osseous dysplasia, the lesions will be seen on either side of the jaw. 
as can be seen in this OPG. The radiographic features of osseous dysplasia may vary according to the stage in which it is seen. These can be categorized as early lesions, mature lesions and end stage lesions. The early lesions will generally present as a periapical radiolucency that is well defined. As you can see in this radiograph IOPA, there is a periapical radiolucency in relation to the mandibular incisor. This would give a differential diagnosis of a periapical cyst or granuloma. However, such pathologies can be ruled out by knowing this pathology better. Periapical cyst or granuloma are inflammatory lesions and are related to a carious process. As can be seen in this image, there is no carious process involving this incisor. But a well-defined radiolucency is present. The patient is asymptomatic and hence it points out to a likely diagnosis of periapical cemento-osseous dysplasia or osseous dysplasia. The mature cases of osseous dysplasia will reveal a mixed radiolucency radio opacity as can be seen in this image. There is a mixture of radiolucent and radio opaque areas. As the pathology progresses, in the end stage, this will show a, a well circumscribed radio opacity associated with the root of the tooth, which is surrounded by a radiolucent rim. So, commonly, the lesions are generally identified in the mature stage or the later stage. But we have to remember the features of the early stage to avoid misdiagnosis. Histopathological evaluation of a sample of osseous dysplasia will reveal fragments of cellular mesenchymal tissue which includes fibroblasts, collagen fibers with numerous blood vessels. There is a mixture of woven bone, lamellar bone and cementum like particles. The final radiographic stage can be seen in the image on the right. The trabeculae of bone will fuse to each other and form large lobular masses composed of sheets of acellular and disorganized cementum like materials. This is how the large cementum like materials can be seen in case of fibrous dysplasia. The osseous dysplasia is a self-limiting disease and it requires conservative management. Surgical debulking is prescribed if the swelling, swelling is extensive. Moving on to the third more, most common type of fibro-osseous lesions that is the ossifying fibroma. The ossifying fibroma is a true neoplasm with significant growth potential. Resembles focal cemento-osseous dysplasia radiographically and to a lesser extent histologically. The ossifying fibroma is also related to a odontogenic or periodontal ligament origin. However, it is a neoplasm composed of a mixture of bony trabeculae cementum like particles, uh, spherules or both. Clinically, a variant of ossifying fibroma known as the juvenile ossifying fibroma can be appreciated. So, clinically the ossifying fibroma can be categorized into two broader types. The more common one is also known as the conventional ossifying fibroma. However, the variant of the conventional ossifying fibroma is known as juvenile ossifying fibroma. Clinically, the ossifying fibroma will present as a painless swelling of the bone. The swelling is slow growing and will occur 
over months, resulting in facial asymmetry. Ossifying fibroma are more common in the mandibular, premolar and molar region. These lesions rarely erode or displace the teeth, but results in significant expansions of the jaw. Ossifying fibroma are more common in the third and fourth decade of life and commonly seen in females. The clinical variant that is the juvenile ossifying fibroma occurs in the first or second decades of life and results in a, a rapidly progressing swelling as opposed to the slow growing nature of the conventional type. Radiographically, the ossifying fibroma presents a mixed radiolucent radio-opaque appearance. It can be seen as well-defined uninocular radiolucency showing foci of radio opacities. The extent of radio opacities is basically dependent on the amount of bone formation in, within the lesion. Root divergence or resorption may be associated in some cases, but these are rare. Histopathologically, a specimen of ossifying fibroma will reveal fibrous tissue with varying degrees of cellularity and contains mineralized material. The mineralized material may be in the form of osteoid of bone or basophilic and poorly cellular spherules called cementoid. The peripheral osteoblastic and uh, the peripheral osteoid and osteoblastic rimming is present. This is the feature which helps us to distinguish it from the case of fibrous display. As you can see in this high power view, we can see irregular trabeculae of bone. The bone are showing osteocytes within lacunae and on the periphery you can see the presence of osteoblasts and a osteoid seam. In addition, we have also described that small acellular spherical cementum like particles may also be seen. When the cementum like particles are predominantly seen, these are referred to as somamotoid variants and are generally seen in the juvenile ossifying fibroma type. When the lesion shows more of bony trabeculae, we refer to it as the trabecular variant. Treatment of ossifying fibroma basically involves surgical enucleation or surgical resection involving a narrow margin of normal bone. The prognosis of ossifying fibroma is good. Recurrences are rare. A discussion board will be created on the Google Classroom for the topic Disorders of Bone. The link to the lecture will also be posted in the discussion board. Students are advised to post any doubts or comments on the discussion page. So we are still going through the coronavirus COVID-19 disease crisis. I hope to hear some good news regarding the reopening of institutions. Until then, we should stay at home and stay safe. Thank you for your patient listening.